10, this is the 11th time that you've directed one of um, Paul's screenplays. And why do you believe it's such a fruitful collaboration? And I believe you allow him to be on set for one thing. When there's so many... Where is he again? <laughs> <laughs> that annoying guy. No <laughs> many misconceptions there. I don't know where to begin, really. Um, well... Oh, um, it's best not to talk about it's it. It's best really. not to talk about it. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we just get on so so, um, and we just annoy each other in a friendly way. So um, no, it's 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 okay. Um, so we'll annoy each other again in the autumn, no doubt, with trying to scratch away at something. But I don't know what. And how about you for a writer, Paul? You, you've written for other directors, of course, but mm. how is it um, di different with Ken? Yeah, don't, don't, don't say, don't yeah, say. Yeah, it's he, too he, difficult. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he tells such fibs. Just don't, <laughs> don't believe a word well, he says. I'll have to wait till he gets out the door. Then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> when it comes to um, Jimmy Grotland's story, when did you first hear about it and why did you feel it was a story that you wanted to tell? Well, I heard about it from an old friend I met in Nicaragua many years ago, a wonderful writer and, um, and actor called Donald O'Kelly. He's a bit of a Jimmy Grelton figure himself, to be honest. And um, so when he told us about the story and we dug into it, we found out that Jimmy, with the eight of his mates, had built this hall, and it was a you know a free, safe place to meet. And what was then a theological gulag, totally controlled by the Catholic Church and the elite. And it was probably one of the. It was always a little hall in a country bog in Leitrim. It was probably one of the truly free spaces in Ireland in the nineteen twenties and thirties. And um, and it was just you know it was just overflowing with ideas and richness and we thought this would be a, just a remarkable way of leading us in to look at uh, uh, Ireland 10 years after the wind that shakes the barley. And there's a, a, a great speech that um, Jimmy gives about 20s New York and how the bubble burst in um, 29 and, and greed mm -hmm. and it felt to me that you know it could have been given today really that speech about 2008 mm -hmm. in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. Was that one of that parallel something that drew you both in? Um, well, yes. I mean, the, the the times were very. Obviously, there are differences, um, but the, because the economic system has has moved on since then and and is more sophisticated. But yes, there was the financial crash which we've had. There was the depression which included mass unemployment which we've had and we've got. And the far right was on the march again, which it was then, and we know where that led, and it's on the march again now. Um, so, so those those parallels are very are very important, um, um, and th th Jimmy Jimmy made those comments, or s s not word for word, but I mean he was saying those kind of things alongside many others, um, and uh, the, the the point he was making was that the, the economic system will never reach equilibrium, it it will go th it is cyc uh, cyclical. Um, and it, it can't provide a decent, dignified, sustained way of life for people with security. And I think that's the key thing Jimmy would have said. And it's the key thing we need to say now. Because, yeah, I mean, some people have accused us of tagging that speech on, but it's actually true to Jimmy's point of view. And I mean, and like they say, the, the economy has changed in some mm -hmm. senses. It's much more globalised just now. Corporations are much more sophisticated. Communications have changed. But, but the essence is still exactly the same, that profit is the most important thing. You know, that growth is the most important thing. And it's not designing an economy around human need. And that's what Jimmy saw was important then, because there were vast quantities of, of, the, of the population, not only in Ireland, but many other parts of Europe, which were without work. And here we are today, you know, 80 years later, with 19 million unemployed, and the right using this tremendous anxiety to their own advantage to blame immigrants. You know, so um, there are, uh, you know, it, it does, you, you can't make total parallel, you know, yeah, yeah. Of things are very important. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, like in, in the 30s, we had three million unemployed and there were no Romanians, Bulgarians, <laughs> Poles, yeah. anyone. And we still have the mass unemployment. <laughs> No, I think you make the, the you know the, the parallels there if people, if the audience wants to make it, isn't it, rather than and and you mentioned it was you know perhaps um, inspired by what he said or um, mm. comes from what he actually said. <coughs> How did you go about balancing sort of the known facts with um, you know some, taking some artistic license and fleshing out what was known? Yes, well, we had to do that because, I mean, there's certain public events that we know about Jimmy's life, the dates he came back, who his family members were, we went to the place, and you, you see that landscape. And, you, and you know, the, the landscape is very, very important because they were in the poorer land. 
it, but implicitly that tells us about the plantation the Catholics pushed off into the more marginal territories. And then when you see the land that's full of reeds, you know people had to go and work in Scotland to pick potatoes to survive. So there's a lot of implicit things that we saw by just going there and you do the research. Talked to Donald O'Driscoll, a wonderful historian, who told us about the times and the different factions. And every moment is very, very complex between right and left and things change and you know, all that constant movement. So we had to try and inform ourselves about all of that and be truthful to that. There are so many things about the private motivations, the kind of the little kind of glimpses of people's personalities, the relationships between them, and that could never be known. So we just have to be honest and upfront and say we're going to invent and imagine those as best we can. The dancing um, is very important. Looks looks quite sort of rough around the edges and raw and very authentic. Um, presumably that was very much what you were going for, rather than a sort of a polished, highly yeah, choreographed yeah, yeah. look. No, it's, it's not Busby Barclay, is it? Really? Yes. I mean, there's, there's no patterns of dancing from above. Um, no, it's it's ordinary people um, just enjoying. I mean, it's a it's a it's not about the accuracy of the steps. It's about their enjoyment and the. The elation and the um, in being invigorated and really loving, just loving life. And and D- Jimmy himself, you know, tries a step or two and he, he dances like a working man, but he, he gets the basics. And he obviously danced in New York, so well, why shouldn't he dance back in Ireland? Um, and just finally, Ken, um, I was interested to read that you'd said that most films either, <coughs> excuse me, most films either reinforce the status quo um, or they're just an escape valve. And I just wondered. What keeps you passionate about making films? Um, well, I think they were talking about the commercial cinema there, and um, I mean mo- most most big commercial films because they're made by big capitalist enterprises. They're made by big corporations, and and the struggle we've got now is against corporate power. So the big corporations, of course, will reinforce the status quo. And if you if you deconstruct the films, you see that they're 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 um, Elevation of the idea of wealth, um, the presentation of of the United States as the centre of democracy, the defenders of freedom and peace. Th- th- this is quite false, really. This this is not true. Um, it's either that, or it's monsters and the rest, and you know, which is which is just just ignore what's happening in the world, just just enter a fantasy world. Um, but film can do so much more. I mean, film is is the most extraordinary medium because it combines drama and visual arts and so much, um, and it, it can it can be as broad as a library, and it isn't sadly, but it could be. So so that's what keeps you going. I mean, it's working. It's an amazing medium that can record and illustrate and explore and elucidate, and clarify and so on. Ken Lynch, Paul Laverty, we're lucky to have filmmakers like yourselves. Thank you very much.